This is the Ideas Podcast, the show where learning and development professionals discuss ideas over a nice cup of tea. Warning, some other beverages may be consumed. In this episode, I catch up with Dr. Luke Hobson about the launch of his recent book, What I Wish I Knew Before Becoming an Instructional Designer, the motivations behind it, and then we discuss backwards design in the world of learning. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Ideas Podcast. Thank you for joining for another episode. Um, this is an exciting one. Uh, we have the one and only uh, Dr. Luke Hobson with us. Um, where we go? Author, L and D star, social media thought leader. Um, that's, that's a dodgy term now, isn't it? Thought leader. Oh, know? it's very dodgy. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably the most horrible thing I'm going to say to you today. Is <laughs> that. Um, but yeah, we've got what YouTube host, podcast host, um, plus the senior instructional designer um, at, and program manager at MIT. Um, just casually, you know, just li- little place you may have heard of it, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is uh, this is very exciting for me um, because I've enjoyed your content for a very long time. Um, so thank you very much for making time to come on the show. Um, let's start as we always do, because we know this, uh, we masquerade, we kind of hide behind the veneer of this is totally a professional L and D podcast. Uh, but in actual fact, uh, people just tune in to find out what people are drinking. Um, so what, what have you got going today? Of course. And Tom, thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. And in the traditional new England fashion, I'm drinking Duncan's, you know, I'm not, doesn't get more Bostonian than that to be able to say that I am drinking our beloved mud water that I will fully acknowledge isn't good, but because I'm from this area, I really love it. So nice. that's what I got. No, that's that that's all good. That's all good. Um, I have it, it's ridiculously warm here at the moment. I'm not sure if you've got it as well. Um, it's a little bit like scary warm. Um, so I've mm-hmm. just gone for a cold Fanta from the fridge. Um, <laughs> There it's, you go. It's that there you go. It's like, hmm, a beer is a significant risk at this point. I may just fall asleep if I stop drinking. Uh, so uh, no, it seems no like kidding. Now, show. are the I was reading that the roads are buckling around. Is that affecting you in your area? Uh, not so much in my immediate area, but not far away. So we're about an hour from London, um, where I mean they closed the airports because planes were sinking into the tarmac. Which is a slight concern when you're landing a plane. I would concern. It's crazy, um, but yeah, no. Yeah. I know. We've, I mean, we've had um, wa- water pipes explode up through pavements and roads um, because of the heat, which is just. I, I mean, but simultaneously, we've also got everyone wandering around going, "Well, it's just all these young people. It's it's been this hot before." And you're like, "Really? It's been so hot, the ground really? has been exploding." That's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's totally fine. Hey, man, global warming's not real. It's all good. It's no worries. It'll just, it'll just breeze over. It's, it's fine. It. Just, just keep looking forwards and everything will be fine. <laughs> it's just fine. Just, just ignore everything. <laughs> it's totally fine. It. It's all right. We will solve it because what we'll do is we'll make an e-learning. And then they'll, the moment they see that, it'll be like, oh, got it. Score 80% on my quiz. And then they'll uh, totally understand the situation. Uh, they definitely won't be smashing the next button to skip. <laughs> not at all. That definitely is not a thing. No, totally. Um, yeah. Awesome. So um, with all that out of the way, uh, let me invite you to introduce yourself properly after my uh, haphazard introduction at the start. <laughs> uh, hey, man, you you gave me way more credit than uh, I, I give myself. But I think to your point, I am someone who doesn't like to have free time and downtime. So I have just found myself doing all these random jobs throughout the last couple of years uh but basically i'm a super learning nerd i love instructional design i love education and somehow i have found myself in a very lucky and cool position where i get to do that on a daily basis and also talk about it on the internet and for whatever reason people like it so i keep on doing it and that has kind of become now my world which is really weird because i don't i don't think about all the things i do until someone like yourself just says like oh and you have this and this and this and i'm like Oh yeah, I do. I, I do these other things. So yeah, that's that's kind of who I am. So before we, I, I kind of thought I, I knew what the first question would be. So here here's a question maybe I would ask because it's something I got asked the other week and I kind of struggled, but then did have an answer. What do you do that's not in any way L and D related? <laughs> That is a great question, actually, because <laughs> now that is so much of my time, that is a fun one. I will say that I really do enjoy working out. I work out like every day. 
Um, so health and fitness was actually the first podcast that I had. I had a learning science health and fitness podcast. Fun fact. That is probably somewhere on the internet somewhere, you know, and in the depths of the internet. We'll find it and share uh, a link in the is, comments. Oh yeah. Goodness. Yeah. I'll be super great to, <laughs> to listen from me from years ago who has no idea what he's doing, how to talk to people. It's going to be super. Uh, but no, I would, I would say doing that and also binge watching anime and playing old school Pokemon games. How's that? Nice. That's, that's been the last couple of things. I downloaded some emulators on my MacBook, and I've just been playing old school Pokemon fire red. Nice. So that, there you go. In my downtime, that is what I've been up to. <laughs> yeah. I, I was always a, a, a Pokemon Blue man, but uh, oh yeah, you know, I, that, but that's I, I, I can respect. At least it's not. Uh, someone was telling me how they they love really old Pokemon games. And then it's what you play. Oh, Ruby. So get out. Oh no 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 no. If no, you no, didn't no, start playing when it was black and white screens, <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, back, back when then, Game Boys could now... be used to attack people because they were big enough and heavy enough. <laughs> Oh, the bricks. Yeah, That's absolutely. It. But now the, the emulators, the fact that you can run it like three times the speed is like, I'm, I'm finishing the game in like three days. It's, brilliant, <laughs> it's like, <isn't> it? what's <laughs> happening? <laughs> it's crazy. No, fantastic. Um, so let's let's dive in. You, you, as you say, you, you do a lot. Um, I think th- one of the things that... Um, that I've I've really enjoyed from you have been has been your podcast, um, but actually also your book, um, which mm. I'm not going to lie surprised me somewhat because yeah. at, at what when it came out I was nine years into my L and D career, um, so I don't buy too many books that are perhaps targeted at you know aspiring instructional designers as such, um, which maybe is a bit of a, a, a mistake, I would say, after this experience, because I read it and it more than anything, it made me stop and think, which is not something I've seen a lot of in the um, aspiring ID space. A lot of it is very, I would say, overly basic without without being too... Um, too negative about it it's very straightforward straight lines and i didn't find that to be a thing so I, I sort of wondered what was the impetus behind writing a book like that that is not just a checklist of learn storyline and then do this and then do that and yay now you're an id um which is overly Daunting. simplistic but sadly not <laughs> that far off what i have seen out there at the minute yeah, uh, that's that's fair enough. So, kind of. So, thank you for buying the book, by the way. Really, really appreciate that. Uh, the book basically came out of how, when I was thinking about the common questions that people have been asking me about over the years, whether it was blog, podcast, or YouTube, and I was just like, you know, doesn't it make sense to put this into one file? And that way I can just like give it to somebody to have a brain dump of all the things that if I was going back in time and talking to myself, I would say, here, this is exactly what you should know about. Here are the the red flags. Here are the warning signs. Here's how to be able to navigate for with networking and with culture. Here's what you actually really should know because there's a lot of things that if you Google, as you were mentioning about just like searching for Mm. instructional design online, and I'm like, yeah, I don't do that. And I'm like, yeah, that's not a part of my world at all. So I just wanted to be able to give someone an insider perspective about my journey. And if it helps them along the way to kind of share those pieces of wisdom, then, you know, so be it. So that was kind of the idea. And as we mentioned about the the start of this, of how you love the, the casual conversation vibe with things, that's what it was going for. Like if you and I were sitting at our local watering hole for a coffee shop, whatever, and we were just shooting the breeze and I just kept on just throwing at you all the stuff that I wish I knew about it would look like that so that's kind of how the book came to be Uh, yeah it's really interesting because I think it's so often um I I kind of have a I have a double-sided argument about experts in our industry um I like to learn from experts absolutely experts are important but I think they're far thinner on the ground as opposed to the title um and I think so often these books get written from the point of view of I'm an expert, listen to me. And Mm. this just struck me as such a tone of, hey, here's an experience as opposed to an absolute sort of fact. Um, The Jedi would be very proud of it. You know, no absolutes, just very... uh, Oh, cool. Very experienced. Um, (laughs) But like even even to the start of the the book, Tom, is like I basically talked about how like I failed out of high school. Like, so I, I wanted to immediately set the table of just like, I am no genius. This is not, 
you know, this is not someone claiming to be the world's greatest expert or the leader of instructional design. But it's like, no, 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 no. This is just, this is just a casual talk of you and I. Here's what I got. Here's what I think can help you. And if it works, fantastic. And if you go down a different path or do something else than that, then you can do that too. You know, whatever. Yeah, and I think there's, I don't know, maybe a little bit of fear around doing that sometimes. Because to admit sure. that you're not, you know, the be all and end all, but you're writing a book. You know, um, I feel like it puts a lot of people away from that space of just whether it's a book or a blog or a YouTube channel or a podcast. I, I, when I've spoken to people, they kind of feel like I, I can't do that. I'm not suitable to give out advice or share my experience because I've only, I, sp- I spoke to someone literally today and I've only been in the industry for 30 years. So they're going, well, <laughs> you've got like 20 years on okay. me and I'm spouting my opinion yeah. everywhere. So you may as well <laughs> jump on board yeah. kind of thing. No, no, pretty much. And especially, too, for our field in particular. Like, obviously, it is no secret that our field has had a tremendous boom mm. over the last couple of years. And the thing, too, is that you don't need to be an expert in literally every single thing. I I will never claim to be. It's impossible. Yeah. Um, and whenever someone talks and I've every time somebody sends me over like a request about how they're trying to learn something more for like the e-learning side of the house, I'm just flat out like I'm not the guy. Like I, you can ask me all you want. I simply don't know. Mm. I, I don't use them on a daily basis. My world is so much more about learning design, about working with subject matter experts, about really like diving on into that learning science slash human skills side of the house. That's what I know. But like, by all means, I still am not the the end all be all when it comes to someone who has written about incredible theories or models or whatever. It's just, I don't know. So this is more of just... Just sharing what I know from the little that I've learned about the last couple of years. There you go. <laughs> no, I love it. I, I think it's it's it, well, it's, it's everything that this, this show's about. Certainly, is about getting people to share experience as opposed to claimed expertise. So I, I, I love it. I was really it was really it was really exciting to read something that was different um, that I enjoyed cool. reading rather than kind of went. There's value in this, so just read it. Um, <laughs> it was nice to enjoy it. Very so, cool. Um, oh, thanks for sharing. But yeah, so. Um, I want to dive into sort of everything you just spoke about, really. Uh, SMEs. I know we want to touch on backwards design. Um, in fact, let's start there because after our initial kind of chat about what we could we talk about, um, that got me thinking about backwards design. And initially, I thought, ah, well, we could touch on it, but I mean, everyone knows about that. Cue the immediate series of conversations I have, where every person I spoke to was just like, nope, sorry, what? Um, yeah. <laughs> so I no. mean, just just because. I'm going, to, I'm going to put it out there now. If you're in the audience thinking, oh, God, I must be an idiot for not knowing it, that's not what I mean by that. This was a stupid mm-hmm. assumption on my part to go, well, everyone must know about this because it's just standard practice. <laughs> standard practice in L&D, right? Who would, who would have thought? Yeah. Um, yeah. So could yeah. you run us through, from your perspective, what backwards design is and how you use it just to get us started? Sure. So in a nutshell, backward design is basically we are first starting with the end goals in mind. We're trying to think about the real problems that we are trying to solve with training and with education. So thinking about the outcomes, thinking about the goals, thinking about the problems. From there, once we have identified those, we are then working our way backwards, hence the name, where we're then trying to figure out what levels of evidence do we really need to see in order to know that learners are progressing, that they are on track and how we can best support them. And then from there, you take one more step backwards towards figuring out everything else that goes into the learning experience when it comes to the learning activities and when it comes to the content. And when you put all three of those together, that is basically the backward design model. It's nothing really too crazy. It's just more of like common sense that I don't know where that kind of fell off in the L&D space where like I will explain this to somebody. And for most people to what we were you know mentioning mm-hmm. about just a couple of seconds ago, most people don't know the name of this model, but I guarantee you, you it because common sense says hey i have a problem what's the best way for me to solve it it's like yeah that's kind of what we should be doing (laughs) regardless in the first place so trying to be able to do that makes a lot of sense and when it comes to i use that for courses and for programs training workshops and everything else but really you can use it for anything as far as for being able to figure out exactly what is a problem and then how do i know that i am progressing i am getting towards being able to find that solution and of course what do i need to build along the way to make sure that i am practicing that i am building up my confidence and my motivation and my self-efficacy and that everything is really coming together, what can I do? And for a lot of folks, they think about it kind of like the opposite. They get handed a textbook and say, build around this. 
where backward design is literally the flip of like, no, 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 like the book actually comes like at the end. The content is at the end of that, but we're thinking more about the goals first. And that's backward design. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, I think I think you're right. Um, I said before that people are doing it without thinking about it, but I think there is a benefit in thinking about it in a not maybe formal is the wrong way, but a more specific term because I think it allows you to kind of narrow it, narrow in on individual sections a little more. Because I kind mm. of feel like I'd agree that everyone starts with there's a problem, but I feel like that middle step often gets either crunched or jumped entirely because the exciting bit is when you get to go, oh, solution, how are we going to fix that problem? <laughs> sure. um, you know, ev- everyone sure. loves that exciting moment where you're like, we could do a this or we could do a that or we could, you know, and you get to do those ideas. That bit in the middle can sometimes feel like it's, oh, it's the needs analysis bit. It's the bit where I have to interview people and talk, oh, I just want to do the fun ah, bit sure. at the end. Um, sure, sure. So I feel like that's so what do you do in your process? And it might be that you really enjoy the middle bit. I don't know. Uh, fill us in, but what do you do um, to, to make sure that process is followed? Cause I know we've all probably felt the pressure of either here's the content go do um, or that time pressure that maybe tempts us to just skip ahead. Um, of course. So what do you so- do to hold yourself to that? So the thing that I think about is that if I skip that kind of middle step, what is inevitably going to happen is that I'm going to have to go back and do this all over again. Mm. Like, I just know. <laughs> like, if I do it, don't do it right the first time, hey, guess who's going to get a revision assignment within the next couple of months is this guy. <laughs> and I'm going to have to go back and redo whatever I did. Mm. So trying to think about that, what I really try to focus on are going to be different forms of assessments that I know that people are going to be able to relate to and speak to and really build around what people are going through. And whether this is something more along the lines of scenario-based learning or for using a project or for a simulation or whatever the case may be, I am very much thinking, always about the target audience and what exactly if they are facing this problem how is this helping them towards being able to really accomplish what they are able to do and hearing from and then getting of course feedback and making sure that I'm constantly connected to my learners because I am always asking about feedback whatever I design whatever I do I am always trying to make sure that I'm talking with them in some shape way or form whether it's surveys or interviews or focus groups or whatever it is I just want to be able to know from them am I on track? Like if I'm making a scenario based type of assessment, did it speak to you? Did it is it actually something that you are currently facing within your job that you are like, oh yeah, I totally know what this means or eh, actually you really weren't on track. You said it like this, but really in our industry, we don't say it like that. We do this instead. All of those really helpful tips to know that that way I know specifically when thinking about if I like map out the entire curriculum, I can pinpoint that assessment and then say, okay, based on that feedback, I can go back, look at that, I can revise that, and then I'm going to give it back to these people and see, am I now on track? And then from there, I kind of keep on going. Oh, do you know, I, th- I think it, I, I've always found it really interesting when I speak to people who work like that, so you, you sort of going back to the, ultimately back to the people, as it were, um, of course. To, 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 yeah. to get that steer. Um, and it, it, it's something that sort of uh, my company's really tried to promote when we work with clients around doing that. And we regularly get the pushback, really get two pushbacks. One is time. Um, I think we kind of already touched on that of you think that takes time. Let's consider doing the whole project again when it doesn't land. Um, the flip side of that sometimes we get is um, why would they know what you, what the right solution would be? Um, they don't know you as the training expert or the learning expert or whatever phrase you are within your business. You should just be able to work that out without having to engage with that end user. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I, I kind of, I would say at the start of my career, I would have fallen into that camp. I would have mm. been there going, no, no, we, it's our responsibility to know this stuff, to know our people so well that we can just figure it out. Um, and it took me a long time to go, yeah, not a clue. Let's just ask them because they'll know immediately. Um, did you go through something similar or is it yeah. always been something that you've done or, or sort of how no, would you to- come to that solution? 
Totally. So the, the very first assignment that I had was I was working on this um, massive project where I had multiple stakeholders and the stakeholders were the senior level management at the organization. Then came my university and then came the stakeholders of the actual learners and then the subject matter experts who were both from industry and academia. So I was like, OK, I have to please everybody. How is this going to work? And of course, every single person was trying to guide me in some direction, shape, way, or form. And basically, I focus more on like just getting a prototype and putting it into the hands of learners to be able to say, this is where I think we are going. And it was interesting because I was able to go into travel to different types of manufacturing plants and interview these people and see in real time and just kind of sit back to see like what it is that they were doing. How were they interacting with everything within the learning experience? And that way, when I saw that information first, I had then had data to then say concretely of, hey, this is what they are thinking and what we should be doing. And then when I went back to the senior management team where they were saying, oh, we need to focus on X, Y, and Z. And I was like, did you know that (laughs) these people over here at this plant think like entirely differently because there there is a misconnection here. And once I was able to kind of be like the middle person and start connecting people to make this open flow of communication happen between the very top of the hierarchy and then the boots on the ground, I somehow became this middle person to try to tie people in together and then using the subject matter experts to bring them into the conversation just so that that way they can say, hey, Luke's not crazy. Like, I was there too. I saw the interaction. So I was trying to get support. I was, I was building a coalition. I was building people around me to gain more influence. And I had the right people in my corner to then be able to make that conversation open up. So for me, it's really been getting that data, having other people witness it, bringing that, and then trying to be able to influence that process from there. So it's, it's definitely happened to me numerous times. Yeah, I, I, I find that kind of really, I always find that process really fascinating because I often think back to the start of my career when I was a face-to-face trainer and I was facilitating content sort of every single day. Um, and part of me, th- when I initially stopped doing that and became more instructional designy, kind of, I didn't have the job title, but you never do in our industry. You do, you get random job titles for a while. Um, I kind of went, oh good, I'm glad I'm doing this now rather than that. But I look back at it now and think, that was invaluable in terms of, as you kind of said, seeing those moments where you went, that's how that person learned that. It was that weird little thing that was the key to that bit of content, get, like making sense to them. Um, and I kind of feel like the further we get from actually being in the room with people, which is not always possible in a literal sense, um, but the further we get from that, the, really the less we understand um, the the impact of the content we're creating, I guess. Um, which is a little bit of a danger, I think, in the in the remote world. Um, everyone mm. likes to work remotely, but sometimes there is no uh, no no uh, better way than sitting in the room and poking someone, going, "What do you think of this?" Um, <laughs> which is <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe don't physically which- poke them. You may end up in front of a HR. You know, probably don't <laughs> probably don't do that but that's what i love too about embedding surveys within like that mm-hmm. module that week that section whatever it is because then when people fill out the survey and they can either say like yes this is relevant for me or perhaps no it wasn't then when you go and talk to them and let's say if we're still in this zoom world or virtual world in uh, 2022 and, and later on you can then still have like an open conversation with people and then actually go and use that sort of as like your guide for your script of how you're going to be hosting these different types of sessions with people to actually go and like download the the survey in Qualtrics and say like, Hey, uh, according to this 75% of you hated that problem. Why? (laughs) Why wasn't it relevant? What could I do better? What are you actually facing? Like, help me understand what is really going on. And it is just so insightful because that way, especially too, if you can bring in leadership or the, the decision makers onto that call and they can just listen And then that way you can have like your own internal team like wrap up afterwards once the folks are gone and you're like, so, hey, we all heard it. (laughs) Like they either really needed this or this or this was a complete overkill. We put in way too much content for this week. Like they hated that, like whatever it is. Then when you get everyone to listen to that, it's pretty undeniable at times, which is a very powerful way of of trying to be able to initiate that change of of what you want to do next. Definitely. And I mean, in terms of the the way you work in that process, do you find that when you release content, you then go through a process of fairly rapid sort of iteration 
once it's actually launched or, you know, I mean, so I spend a lot of time working with vendors where iteration is dangerous for them um, because they're selling a product. So they, if they launch something in a week later going, actually, we've changed our mind. We're going to change that. (laughs) <laughs> you know, that is a slightly different proposition there. Um, but for you, what what does that look like? So what it looks like for me is that we have people who are willing to agree to be a part of a pilot program and know that it's not done, which it, it, it very is clear. Like there will be like a banner that says like more to come on like a page or two. So it's like, you know, it's, it's clearly a pilot. But then what we do is that we collect the survey information at the end of every single week. And then from there, once that's done at the end of the very last survey, so let's say it's like a three week training, something like that. At the end of the very last survey, it will then say, hey, are you willing to participate in a follow up conversation next week? If you are, please drop your your name and email below. And then I am communicating with people and I'm setting up these mini focus groups and we immediately have that conversation. And then where I spend more of my time is actually like listening to all that, reading the notes of what the people actually said during the, the focus groups and then thinking more about how I designed everything, putting the final touches and then making those revisions and then unleashing it again. That process, depending upon what it is, it could be a month, it could be three Three months. If it's a, I mean, if it's a huge thing, then, then we're talking more time, and it's like it's slowly leaking out to be able to get that. But I am always, always saying if we can get real in time feedback, that's that's where the money is. Because um, I work in higher ed, and I have seen a lot of folks in higher ed who will wait until sixteen weeks at the end of the semester, where they're like, "Here's the course evaluation," and it's just like, "Do you think anyone remembers anything from week two? No. Yeah. They no, it, they no, don't. It, yeah. So you need to know, like that week, that minute, what do they feel, and and that's what's going to be helpful. Yeah, I, I find that so. Int- I I find it particularly interesting because I attempted to do um, a distance degree as, a, as oh, sure. an adult yeah. learner online, and yep. um, I found it to be diabolical, to be honest. Um, for exactly that reason, it was clear they had never asked a learner anything. Um, it was very clearly, and I shan't say who this was with, uh, though it wouldn't be difficult to work out. Uh, <laughs> don't get sued. Uh, Number one rule of podcasting, don't get absolutely. sued. Absolutely. <laughs> Never n- mention anyone by name. Nope, um, nope, Just nope. say, you know, if you really wanted to know, you could go to my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> uh, basically, it was a case of, well, we've got this textbook that we teach, right? And we've got Rise. Right. And the two shall come together. Uh, <laughs> It's like, oh, good, you've um, you've just rewritten a textbook. That 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 was apparently the approach we were going to take, um, and it was just the most. Especially by that point, I'd been in learning for maybe four or five years, and it was the most depressing experience. And I finally just went, no, I don't care. This was really expensive. I can't spend many years doing this. I'm out. Um, and it was at that moment I kind of went, I wonder how many people have that exact experience. Mm-hmm. Um, in especially as kind of, um, I think distance learning for further education has definitely increased. Um, certainly when I did it, I, everyone was a bit kind of like, oh, that's a bit of a weird way to do it. Um, but now I know loads of people that want to do it, right? Whether it's they decide to do it over the COVID break or whatever it might be. Um, they, you know, it, I hope it's come a long way. Um, and I'm sure some places it has. And I think people like yourself will be moving that, but. It, it surprised me. I always had this very kind of um, higher education must get it better than the corporate world get it. Was always mm-hmm. my view. They must mm-hmm. understand this stuff better because I have always felt that maybe sometimes corporate has better tech available to it, um, but that the higher ed side has a better understanding of learning, which is arguably a bit more important. Um, maybe that's not such a clean cut line anymore as people have moved between the two more, I think, no. but I no. kind of always had that perception. Um, do you think that's true or cause I have no experience really working in the higher ed space. So Sure. So I would say that, so let me first say that things have definitely gotten better over time. Mm. Um, I don't, I don't know when you went for your, what, what year did you go for your degree? Oh, the online part. It would have been what five five years ago ish. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was gonna say when I started to take graduate, I started to take graduate courses online back in 20, 20, 26, uh, 2010, But I took a variety between two thousand six and two thousand ten. I started just to, you know, do some online stuff. Um, and what, what I experienced at the time is that every single course was set up in the exact same way. 
And that's what drove me nuts because I was just like, it's always the same. Like no, nothing has changed is that every single week you want me to go and read chapters from XYZ book. I then must submit three discussion posts and then submit an essay for 12 weeks, every course. And I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this is, this is killing me. Like I, there's no challenge. There's no nothing. I just, I don't understand. And I remember I would actually submit papers. Like I would start the paper at 11 PM just to give myself some form of a thrill of like, can you finish this before midnight? And I was like, oh, let's see if I'm going to do it or if I'm going to fail. Like, I don't know. And that was my way to get excited about courses that were just, they, they didn't do it. Or I was like, ah, yeah. but I also have to be aware and say, too, that there are certainly some organizations out there who like who just really started to, to come around and really get that. And obviously, the instructional design movement has been huge and people are hiring more left and right. And also, unfortunately, I know of some people, too, who are just doing literally the very best they possibly can and their school gives them no support. It's like, so sorry, no budget, no help. Uh, the faculty member is going to ignore you for the fun of it. Good luck, you know, kind of thing. Nice. So it's like, hey, no, no kidding. The, the course isn't good. I wonder why, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, obviously, like it, it needs to be. And that's why for the major institutions out there, if in the online learning space, they have like one voice. They, they understand about like, OK, we have to do this together. There has to be a partnership. We need to make sure there is a fully staffed department with people who are trained and know what they're doing. But also they have access to our faculty. They will be working together. There is going to be some form of checks and balances and quality assurance and everything like that because that's needed. So from the higher education stance, you would hope that they have that. But like I said, I know of a few folks where they're the L and D team of one at X Y Z, you know, school, uh, community college, university, whatever it is. It's all all throughout. Yeah. Where you're like, how? And it's and when you hear too, unfortunately for some of them, it's like, yeah, I'm responsible for a portfolio of like 30 live courses. And it's like, I'm so sorry because if things go down, if they break, like it's it's you and that's there's there's no one else kind of thing so it's it all depends is a long way of answering your question it all yeah, depends no, it, it's so interesting because i think there's there's kind of this it's kind of global and in industry at the same time there, there's an there's an online illusion that everything is getting far closer and that we're all that all industries are far more similar than we think but actually i think there are some big differences that like i would never have thought that was that amount of variation or maybe that level of in some circumstances almost disregard for the value of that in that space i always kind of went oh there they must be you know compared to the corporate id in the uk they must be treated as kings kind of thing because people get the importance of learning um whereas i know certainly at the start of my career i spent a lot of time going why does no one see the value of what this team does um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. only later did i get, did i adjust to the mindset of Hmm, maybe the team did not do a very good job of demonstrating its value. That's true. Um, yeah. Including myself. I was part of that team. Sure. Um, sure. I think totally. it was a bit of a, I don't know, it, the L&D ego has to die off. I think after the, the first three years, I found myself going, L&D, we should be leading everything. And then going, ah, no, that's a really bad idea, actually. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've learned my lesson. Yeah, it's, for sure. Uh, for for sure. One, one thing that I will say that, I love the the approach that we have been taking at MIT that I really haven't seen for a lot of other different um, organizations out there is that for when you read about and hear from some people within the higher education instructional design world, for some people, they will tell you a story about how so-and-so professor kind of like walked into the office and basically said like, you're making my course. And the team's like, we have to. This person's a super big deal. Like for a political reason, we must we must do the thing. They have the say. We are just here. And it's just like, OK, nice. what I like about my organization is that we do market testing and research first. So it's like, hey, you have an idea. Cool. Let's do some testing. Let's see if people are trying to solve their problem through education in this certain area. And I just think this was smart. It's like because there's plenty of organizations out there right now for universities and they're unfortunately they're closing their doors and they have all these other different things. And it's just like, yeah, it's because you're offering all these programs that people are not interested in or they're not doing well in the real world. So they're not going to enroll or perhaps the learning experience is just blah. And like the word of mouth is spread of like, don't go here kind of thing. There's a lot of different things. But step one is trying to once again, like backwards design. Step one. Are you solving the problem with education? If yes, okay. Let's, let's talk about this a bit more. But don't just 
say that every single thing is going to be a slam dunk. Every program is going to be incredible because it's, you know, it's a, a super tough sell if it's if it's not going to be what people are looking for. Definitely. Definitely. I can agree more. Um, so let's change tax. Um, SMEs and SME relationships. Um, I definitely want to speak to you about this because it's something that I think over the course of my career, I've had to come to realize the importance of that relationship and simultaneously cast about going, why is this not the conversation that everyone is having everywhere all the time? Why? I mean, I, when I decided I wanted to move into L and D, I went off and did a series of like three level three, five and seven courses with CIPD in the UK. Um, barely a mention of it. <laughs> oh, SMEs, yep, they're, they're important. You'll need to build a relationship. Moving on. Um, uh, and I look back and went, that should have been like 90% of the course because it's sure as heck 90% of the job, um, at least in my experience. Um, so when you talk about it, you know, first of all, what got you talking so much about it? Because I think you do it more than almost anyone else I've seen. Hey, well, that's, that's pretty cool <laughs> to hear. But uh, but just like what you just said, though, of how I heard from so many people going back to school for degrees, especially in instructional design. And then I would hear that they had no idea about working with subject matter experts. And they would talk about that, mm-hmm. especially for some of them who are like, oh, I'm, I'm about to graduate in three months. Uh, we only talked about theory and uh, a few things here and there for some tools. And um, I keep reading about this me thing. And I'm like... Oh, no. Is, ah, but yeah, because if I was to now train someone from start to finish, as you mentioned, it's going to be 90% of working with other people. And then let's talk about how adults learn and putting it together. It's so crucial. I don't know how this has become this. It, it fell to the wayside for some reason, which I never, ever understood. And I did not know how to work with other people in this type of way where I mentioned about the hierarchy of higher ed. And that's there and is there everywhere. It doesn't matter where you are. There's always going to be someone's boss's boss's boss that you're working with. And you're like, oh, you're super important. I can't screw this up kind of thing. And when I was working with SMEs at first, I didn't know about how to properly introduce myself, how to explain about the importance of instructional design, my value of being on the project. So all of my projects went terrible for the first couple of years. I just didn't know. I was just like bashing my head against the wall. Like, why does everybody feel like I'm just kind of there and I'm not really contributing? Like, I'm not talking in meetings. I'm not copied on emails. It's like I was the the last person to know about stuff. I was just like, I feel like I'm doing this wrong. I feel like my job's really important. And uh, I'm just I'm not doing it justice to back what you said earlier. Like, I'm, I'm clearly not doing the right thing. And then that's when I really just kicked it into overdrive and just kind of said like, okay, I'm just going to focus on working with people. And it's like, step one, if I'm going to be working with somebody, what's the first thing I should probably do? Well, I should probably research them first to see their experience, what they're talking about, where they went to school, what are they passionate about? And for some people, they're like, well, how do you do it? And I'm like, I just use Google. Like with any any common thing, like even before you and I were talking, Tom, like I know who you are. We've talked online before, but like if I didn't know you, yeah, I would definitely Google you. I would see your LinkedIn profile. I would look at your last couple of posts to see what you're passionate about. And then sure enough, I would find more things. And especially for a lot of my subject matter experts, they also have some kind of presence online too, whether it's going to be from uh, white papers and academic journals or blogs or LinkedIn profiles or even speeches on YouTube. I, th- I think that actually might be one of the most common things I find is that there's some kind of not not ted talk but some kind of film somewhere about them doing a lecture or presentation or blah 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 and i will consume all of that i am watching everything so that that way when i do have the first conversation with you i at least know something and it doesn't feel like i'm just some random dud who doesn't have a clue what's going on and then you have to coach me up for the next two hours so was trying to get that groundwork first and then honestly just making a real relationship so it's like in your background after we were talking about a few things i would comment on your guitars because you can see i have guitars in my background too so i would try to form a little bit of a bond and talking more about that and letting you know that like I'm a real person you can eventually build a rapport with me you can let your guard down you don't need to be so like close to the vest kind of thing like we are going to be working together so let's start this off on the right foot and not just do what I think a majority of instructional designers do where they basically say like hey I'm working with you let's start talking about this and it's like 
no, don't, don't, do, don't throw at them templates and guides and make them fill out different stuff. It's like, no, 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 like you need to, you need to build this up first before just launching into something. So that's why I started to talk a lot more about it compared to uh, a couple of years ago. Yeah, no, I, I find it interesting because it's, I think there's often so much focus on, oh, they're an SME. We almost forget that before they were an SME, they were a human being. They Believe were. it or not. Yeah. Right? <laughs> somewhere deep beneath that SME name tag is like a normal human name. Um, and we kind of forget to engage with them at that level. And I feel like sometimes part of the reason, especially um, for you know, people like my organization, we, we work with businesses very short term. Um, so we, we're not going to have three, four year relationships. We're going to go in and go, well, we're here for six months. Let's, let's power forwards. Um, and often I feel like that can be quite destructive of those relationships. Yeah. Um, because you do have to build them quite quickly. Sure. Um, but everything you said there, I think is a spot on example of how it doesn't have to take a huge amount of time just to almost give that tip of the hat to say, Hey, look, I'm here to help guide or whatever your position in this project might be um but i respect what you're bringing to the table and therefore have looked at it before i think that goes a uh, an incredibly long way um i saw I, can, I can't remember who posted it but someone shared on linkedin not long ago um you know uh you could be the person that calls someone the their name this week um <laughs> sure. and see how they react to that sure. um and i thought that so that kind of human consideration um, kind of gets a bit lost sometimes in the excitement over, you know, whether it's authoring tools or learning theory or whatever it might be. Um, so when you are building those kind of, kind of longer term relationships, then um, you've got that initial personal touch researching them. You're not always going to agree with an SME. Um, oh. Sometimes yeah. the job is to say in a more polite way, you're wrong and this is why, or that solution won't work because of X, Y, and Z. Um, what do you find you do to make sure when you're having those conversations, they don't damage that relationship in any way? So funny enough, and I so far, I think I'm the only person who does this, um, because it's really awkward and weird at first when you first do it, because you're like, oh, this is super uncomfortable, but it helps. Before we get to that point, of an escalation while we're still on good terms and everything is going, you know, nice in the honeymoon stage at the beginning. I ask how they deal with conflict. I was like, what is hypothetically speaking, we have a problem. Something else comes up. What is the best way for us to be able to work together? How would I support you through that? And most of the time people are like, what? (laughs) I'm like, yeah, I know. It's kind of a weird thing to talk about. But like, if you get upset and I'm upset, how do you like to work things together? How do we solve this conflict? And I asked one person one time, and this is when I started to keep on repeatedly asking that question, but I asked him and he was just like, give me a second. And he thought about it and he was just like, okay, do not, this is like my biggest pet peeve. Don't give me a compliment sandwich. I was like, Oh, like no problem. He's like, I hate when people do that. Don't just, if you have an issue, he's just like, honestly, if you just tell me, just tell me straight, just give me like no fluff, no nothing. Just say, here is the problem. And then say, Hey, can we solve it together? Then we can just move on with our lives. And I was like, you got it. <laughs> like he very much, which, which it did not come across that way, but he was like that. Like we had a great conversation. We were laughing. We were joking. So I assumed he would be the kind of like, oh, I need to go and deliver this news in a delicate way. And instead, when he was like, nope, I don't work like that. Just if it's broken, tell me to fix it. I'll fix it. We'll move on with our lives. It's like, yes, sir. Okay. (laughs) That's what we do. So before, like what I try to do for like basically everything is before we hit an escalation point, if you can do that groundwork and build out that foundation, even if you don't have all the time in the world, as you were saying, if even if it's just a one-off kind of thing, whatever you can do beforehand is going to be so much more supportive because then the person is willing to work with you as if they don't have a relationship with you. They have nothing to give for you. They don't really you know, care about you being on this project. Then that's when all temperatures and all things just break loose because people don't care. Because they're like, Bof, I'm never going to see Luke again, whatever. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. And it's just like, but wait a second. Like, we actually have a good relationship. <laughs> so you're probably not just going to reel into me and, and like hate me for something. We're going to try to make it work. So that would actually be my advice. If you can, if at all possible, I would do that first. Yeah, no, I think that it's interesting because I think it's, it's quite a brave thing to do as well. Because I think a lot of people are very nervous about 
even bringing up the potential that there might be conflict even though we all know there is totally going to be like oh, the chances course. of you and yeah. all your stakeholders and SMEs agreeing about everything all the way through. I mean, if you do, it's probably not a good thing. No, um, no, it's going to be a very <laughs> boring experience. <laughs> Basically means everyone's just in the room going, yep, 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 all the way through. That's not a good sign. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think it is quite nerve wracking. Uh, but I, it, I think it's something we talk about a lot anymore, but when I first became like a people manager, I went to an amazing training course that unfortunately I can never remember the name of or who ran it, but it was all about the idea of social capital mm. um, and almost treating relationships in workplace like a bank. Um, and that always re really stuck with me in the idea that if you go overdrawn, then the relationship withers. Mm -hmm. um, the more overdrawn you are, the less... Um, longevity the relationship has eventually the bank will foreclose effectively on your relationship um and that that, that kind of simple visualization of it really works for someone like me for for instance i'm not a very good people person naturally it, it's something i've always struggled with mm. um so being able to think right is there money in the bank and how do i put money in the bank really helps with that kind of thing and you know i think what you're talking about there i think the idea of straight up asking someone about conflict is fantastic i often ask them about like how do you like to receive feedback sure um to like my team and stuff sure but asking an sme about conflict i think is a fantastic move it I mean, it is to, uh, saved me so many headaches because people remember and they're like oh yeah we talked about this and it's like we did like, I know we're heated. I know things aren't cool right now, but we did talk about this for this exact same reason. So it, it really has helped. And I, I love the, the bank analogy, by the way. I never heard of that. That's awesome. That was. No, I, I, it stayed with me. So, again, I can't take the credit. I wish I could credit sure. <laughs> whoever ran that training course. It's that. And I went on an amazing training course called Arrows in the same week. Um, no one else has ever heard of Arrows. Nope. Um, it's hilarious. <laughs> um, basically, the whole principle of the two-day course was always assume you're wrong until you have evidence otherwise, um, mm -hmm. rather than assuming everyone else is wrong and, you know, you're mm -hmm. right. Um, but it did it with kind of like arrows up and diagonal and in before out and all this. It was very cool. It's a classic example of one of those kind of sort of mid-2000 management leadership. I would say the golden era of management leadership training before it got a little bit... Um, profitable yeah shall we say yeah and now sure. it's full of some very questionable uh stuff yeah um so with uh with um the the, the sme side of things you now um run sessions through edgeflow mm -hmm. on um sme right yep. um we we had um david from edgeflow back in like season one of the podcast oh, cool. talking about cool. you know all, all, all sorts of stuff he was really excited about and edgeflow was quite new then uh, so it's great to see how far that's come um I was really impressed to see how excited people were about a course about engaging with SMEs. Um, because I've always, whenever I've spoken to people about it, it's been the last thing people want to talk about. Everyone gets very excited about technology or, you know, the, the quote unquote fun stuff. Um, usually it comes with a big price tag and, you know, yeah. you can post about it on LinkedIn the next day or whatever it might be. Um, so how have, how have you found sort of the people engaging with that? Is everyone that goes on that kind of thing new to role or new to industry? Or do you find you get more experienced people doing it as well? So it's funny, I get all people. So I will have plenty of aspiring instructional designers who have said, I have now read like a million guides on how to prepare for instructional design interviews and I now know that a SME question is going to be in every interview. <laughs> so I want to prepare now. And I was like, oh, you're so brilliant. Yes, <laughs> that makes so much sense. But then also I'll get instructional designers of 15, 20, 25 years. And they're this year saying, I'm trying to learn some new strategies. I got this one SME that I work with and he is a jerk and we just don't get along. I'm here trying to figure out what else can I learn? What can I do the next time around? And that's what I think is so awesome because then we do weekly workshops and there's peer reviewed feedback and a, and a whole bunch of different things for us being able to work together. But I love hearing from one another about like, oh, that's a great question. Let me tell you based on my experience what I have done. But then now let's talk about like what we just learned in class that how if I applied this technique to my past experience, that could have probably changed the outcome. There's a lot of different things in the forms of reflection to make sure that we're thinking about past experiences, taking what we're now knowing and how we can apply that in order for the future to make things better, you know, the next time around. But that has been so wild because I did not know 
who is going to join? I was like, I'm making a class on how to work with people. And also the stigma is that they're very difficult people. Like, I'm not sure if anyone's going to sign up for this kind of thing, but it's needed. Like, people need to know this kind of information. So it, it blew my mind that hearing that we've now had people from everywhere, from all walks of life and from higher ed and corporate and freelance and, you know, you name it. And some folks enroll their entire um, instructional design team from their university into the courses, just saying, like, we know that we have very difficult subject matter experts here. We need help. I was like, all right, great. I'm glad. That's kind of... The, the whole point is to try to make instructional design better for everybody. So, so I'm glad you're here, but it's, it's been wild. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I, I was going to be my last question about SMEs, but I just want to ask one more yeah, before we yeah. wrap up, actually. Um, difficult SMEs. So I, I've got an opinion on difficult SMEs, sure. which is that I don't think many SMEs are difficult. I think instructional designers aren't that easy to work with sometimes. Uh, and I include myself in that of course um, me, too. me too and it took me a very long time i think to admit that to myself um not to say that no smes are difficult because mm-hmm. every person has the potential to be an ass at some point um i know i capitalize on it regularly i get good feedback from my other half on that <laughs> she's very useful in that sense um what are your thoughts around that when someone says i've got a difficult sme um you know, how often do you find it is the SME? How often do you find it's the ID? And where do you think sometimes that, I don't know, that misallocation of blame sometimes comes from? It's usually to blame is miscommunication. Like nine times out of 10. Miscommunication happened. And for, and of course, as you mentioned, there are some people who are just straight up not nice human beings. You know, and it's just yeah. like, yeah. So totally. if you tell me a story about someone is yelling at you and it's like, yeah, okay, that's not a good person. No, yeah. th- this isn't going to go well. Like we're trying, <laughs> I think that person's an exception. But for the most part, when I hear that the subject matter expert was say difficult and I can give you like a, a ton of different examples, but one that I really thought was eye opening because it took a lot of work between myself and this one student to really figure out what was, what was happening. Cause she kept on saying about how every interaction they had with the subject matter expert it never aligned it always basically was that the SME basically kind of come in and basically said something along the lines of like hey you're doing 90 percent of the work fantastic here are my slides have a great day and like would walk out and every single time it kept on happening to her and she's like something's not right like it's it's not just one or two people it's every single person and I started to ask, and I was just like, where do you think they are getting this information from? And she's like, I don't know. Like, there's, It must be word of mouth. And I was like, well, maybe. And I was just like, but are you actually a part of the introduction calls when this person comes into the project, like a kickoff call, usually a kickoff call? And she's like, oh, no, I'm, I'm not part of a kickoff call. I am the person who will basically, the SME gets emailed uh, about my contact information. And then we start working together after the project kickoff call has launched. And I was like, I have a favor. Can you attend the kickoff call? Tell your boss, I, I got to attend this. It's really important for me. I want to be there. And um, she's like, all right, let's, I'll, I'm going to do that and I'll report back to you. So she does. <laughs> and she comes back. She's like, so uh, Luke, I figured out the problem. And I was like, all right, what's the problem? And she was just like, my boss told him I would do everything. And I was like, hey, there you go. <laughs> so it's like, I'll do oh my, it. and it's just, you know, and of course it was like months and months and months of her life just saying like, it must be me. I got to be screwing up. Like, why is this person kind of hate me? And it's just like, no, your leader literally is this like, don't worry about it. It's so great to have you. This person will do everything. And it's like, oh no. Um, but also I could tell you too, that I, I mean, certainly I'm a human being. I made plenty of mistakes. I was given feedback about one SME from one of my colleagues who basically told me that they were super difficult to work with. They had an awful experience working with them. Like, you know, just go into this, your guard is up, you take control, you take the lead kind of thing. And I was like, Okay, I listened to my colleague and I was like, all right, here we go. So sure enough, like I walked into there basically being like my way, the highway, this is what we do. And then after like 20 minutes or so, there was no resistance or pushback or anything. And basically, they looked like they were dead in their eyes. And I was like, yeah, I screwed up. I was like, 
So let's um, let's stop talking about me in my way and tell me more about you and what it, and like as we started to have this conversation, I realized that the problem that this other person had when working with this this other um, individual is that their schedules weren't aligned, so they never could understand about their working preferences, the same timing. They never could basically meet in the middle anywhere. It always was like a just it, it did not work out. And come to find out, the other person almost like demanded that they worked on things together. And for this particular SME, they were the most creative when they were working solo by themselves. And then they wanted to have a recap and say, here's what I worked on over the weekend. Can we review it together? And as soon as like I, I started to sense that, I was just like, oh, yeah, of course. If you want to work on that by yourself, then like, yeah, absolutely. We could meet together on Mondays later and we'll we'll then brainstorm and see if we need to revise stuff. But yeah, if you're creative over the weekends, then like... I'm not going to demand you meet up with me every Tuesday at three. Like, that's just stupid. Yeah. And after that, she was like, oh, okay. And she was absolutely pleasant to work with afterwards. So I was like, yeah. it's just, you know, it's just one of those things. So it definitely, it's, it's just always com- miscommunication is what I usually find at the root of the problem at the end of the day. No, I don't like that. I think that's definitely, in my experience anyway, I've seen, I've seen very similar stuff. And the one thing that always stuck with me when I started freelancing, I went to someone that had been freelancing for years and I said, you know, how, how will I be successful? And they said, don't worry about being great at what you do. Just be easy to work with. Ah, um, dig it. Yeah. They said, you can, you can get competent later. If you're easy to work with, people will like you. They'll want to work with you and they'll want to help you. And that will, that will get you through. It's like, huh. Go figure. Yep. <laughs> um, Love it. Still ignored that advice, like yeah, yeah, of course. that age of course. does, and went and messed up a load of projects and then learned it the hard way. But uh, in that, now it rings true. Um, so I always like to finish these off um, in with the same question, uh, which is a kind of broader L and D industry question. Mm. As you look out at everything that is the world of learning today, what are you most excited about? What do you want to see more of? And is there anything that you're maybe concerned or less thrilled about seeing? Mm, Sure, sure. So what I think that I am really excited to hear more about is that every time I will do a presentation on backwards design, I give the example of how I started to make podcasts for my own courses. And even though podcasting has been out for years, it still is this like people don't think they think about it as like entertainment. They don't think about it as like, wait, I can actually teach people and like use this as my content. It's like, yeah, you don't need a book all the time. You can learn from a podcast and then build activities around the podcast. And when I start to give those examples and hear that other people are making podcasts and courses and they're doing that for a variety of universities or corporate or or any other sector, um, that is extremely cool to me because it's. It's just something that I personally use every day. And the fact that we have so many adult learners don't just try to conform them to make them read textbooks like what we had to endure in online learning. Like there's so many more options besides just using one resource. So that I am super excited about to see podcasts catching on. When it comes to things that are getting bigger that I'm like, eh, I don't really know. I would say... Hmm. Do I want to say this because it's going to probably get me, you know, fire. Uh, I will say that there is so much talk about thinking of the future when it comes to, let's say, with with, uh, with virtual learning, with uh, XR, with with ARV. And like, and I understand. I understand the cool. I understand the toy. I, I, I totally understand. But I also understand the fact that while the future is this like some people think it's super far away and now we're finally getting things. It's like I want to be able to remind people that we still haven't perfected how like adults learn online and do it in a great way. It's just like instead of thinking that uh, maybe this is a more eloquent way of saying it is that I don't think more technology is going to solve the problem of people going back to school and being like, wow, this sucks. And it's like. Yeah, now you're just wearing a headset and being miserable. So instead, <laughs> why don't we focus first on the core goals of why you're here, how we can help you, and if it is applicable and we can do something in the virtual world and it makes sense for everyone, then yes. But don't just assume that we are going to throw more things and especially potentially more expensive technology that people are not going to have access to. And it's going to, um, you know, unfortunately have this negative impact on other people who aren't going to have the same experience. Let's think about the tools that we currently have in place and start using that. Uh, You even mentioned Eduflow and David being on the show, which is awesome. I mean, Mm -hmm. even just using a learning platform that allows me to build things the way that I want to be able to build on it. And I don't have to do some weird back end stuff where I'm like, oh, I 
put in a banner. I just broke everything. Fantastic. It's like, I don't, I don't have that issue. It's like, why did it take me until literally this point of time in my life to say like, oh, that, that learning platform does what I want. Like, okay, great. Now I can think about other stuff. So uh, I would just say to try to, to try to slow our roll, make sure that we're, we're taking things one step at a time and planning accordingly for what we want to do. So you're saying NFTs, not necessarily the future of digital learning. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, before you spend your Bitcoin on your new NFT, I, I don't know. I have some thoughts. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, <laughs> thank you. And that's, that's a brilliant note to end on. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you so much for making the time to come and chat to us. It's been, uh, it's been great to, to kind of uh, get, get your thoughts on these things and hear about what you're doing. Um, if people want to get in touch, I mean, it's not difficult. If they found me, they will almost certainly already have found you. Um, but where's the best place to get in touch? Oh, and thank you once again, Tom. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been a ton of fun to be on your show. Uh, if people just want to Google me, if you just Google Luke Hobson, or if you specifically Google Dr. Luke Hobson, then I pop up more. I was uh, getting B out in the rankings for SEO for a while until I finally added the doctor into my website. And all of a sudden now it's like, ah, the I know, it, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and now there's another, there's an, an amazing up and coming swimmer who's also named Luke Hobson and he's beating all of these state records. And I'm like, I'm glad you're doing well, dude, but you're killing me. <laughs> I'm going to break your legs. Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you are now my enemy. I'm so sorry. But like, <laughs> so if you Google Dr. Luke Hobson, the podcast, the book that all the other stuff will pop up and you can find me fantastic and we'll make sure to have links to everything in the description of this episode uh thanks once again for coming on the show and thank you to you in the audience for tuning in uh before you go i know you're in a rush you've got better things to do um but let me know in the comments what you're taking away from this conversation what might you change and if you do do something off the back of this come back in a month or so and let us know how it's worked have things got better have things got worse worst case scenario you can come back and blame me Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Ideas Podcast. If you haven't already, please consider liking this episode and subscribing to the channel. If you'd like to support us, we do have a Patreon for as little as just £1 per month.